chapter 7, verse 14. Last week, we studied the first 13 verses of this chapter. And we talked about what? Do you remember? We talked about traditions, right? We, as we talked about traditions, we talked about um, what a tradition is. We talked about uh, what had happened with regards to in the text how that some, especially the Pharisees, they had begun to make the traditions, the oral traditions especially that had been passed down, but the traditions of men, they began to make them law, and they had begun to say that these laws or these traditions were those things which they were to practice. And Jesus is trying to explain to them, or teach them rather, maybe we should say, Jesus is trying to teach them, no, it's, traditions are traditions. They are man-made, and thus they're not binding on anyone. And so he then, when he gets down to <clears throat> verses 10 and 11, well, I actually go back 9, 10, 11, 12, he, he gives them a, an example. He tells them, look, some of you have accepted the tradition of when you have something, you call it korban, which means a gift from God. And he says, then you say, because you've called it korban, you do not have to use it to help your family, to help your parents especially. And he said, that's just a tradition. That doesn't work with regards to the law of God. And yet that's what some had done, and they had had accepted this tradition as fact. Well, he's going to go on and he's going to make a declaration here, then beginning in verse 14. It says, uh, beginning, it says, When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There's nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And so he begins to talk then about it's more than the externals. And these are, are some verses that some folks have misapplied and, and mistaught through the years. But notice what he said. He says, I want you to hear this. Nothing that enters a man from the outside, which can defile him, but it's the things that come out. Well, because of that, there have been those that have said, well, now it really doesn't matter what you put in here. It doesn't matter what you put in your body. You can do what you want to. That's not what these verses are teaching. These verses are teaching the importance of the what? The heart, right? Not the, not the ticker, not the, not the one that beats, that spreads the blood around in our bodies, but the heart from the standpoint of the spiritual man. What's important is the inside man, because ultimately if the inside man is all right, what's going to happen? The outside man will be all right as well, right? And so then those things that are on the outside that would come in that would harm him, if you will, those things won't be taking place. Why? Because the inside is clean. We have to get the inside clean before we can get the outside clean. Do you wash your car from the inside out or the outside in? Doesn't matter, right? Although I did have a man tell me one time, a long time ago, and uh, he said, uh, I was talking to him on a Saturday. His mother lived two doors down, and I said, well, what have you been doing today? And he said, well, we went to the car wash, and we washed our car. I said, well, that's great. He said, no. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, we washed the car, and then we got the floor mat that, and we started beating them to get the dirt out, and he said all the dirt went to the car because it was wet. So it was a bad idea. So it has nothing to do with this other than the fact that see, we need to get the inside clean. And once we get the inside clean, the outside will take care of itself. And so Jesus is, is teaching, he's teaching Pharisees that formalities are not as important as what's inside. Now, he's not teaching that you can't have formalities, you can't have traditions. 
We have traditions. Wednesday night that we said is a tradition. The way we pass out the Lord's Supper, a tradition. A baptistry in the building, a tradition. I'm thankful. I don't, I've, I've baptized, in, I've baptized in a swimming pool, I've baptized in a creek, I've baptized, I don't know, a couple other places probably, but wherever there was water, but, but, uh, I like, I prefer a baptistry. <laughs> They're a lot easier and a whole lot cleaner. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the Pharisees needed to learn this lesson. But they thought, well, okay, let's take care of the washing of the hands especially. Let's worry about the, the externals. And Jesus says, no, it's, it's the internals. But then he's in verses 17 through verse 23, he says, and when it, or, or let's read the text. Says, when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him because it does not enter his heart but his stomach and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. The heart. Biblical heart. Biblical heart is the seat of emotions. It's where everything starts from. It is seen as the the beginning of all things, if you will. And so... The Bible tells us, keep, our, keep your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart. And we talk about keeping your heart pure and taking care of your heart. Jesus explains why. He explains why because he says, look, we think about all of these things. And look, look at the list, verse 21 and 22. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All of these things are pretty pretty much, not every one of them, but all of them for the most part are what? Externals, right? These are things that you see. You see these things, but you see the effects, really, of what's inside. The heart. And so that's where it all begins. And that's where we, we have to convince people that we need to make sure that we're right on the inside. That we have our mind made up. We have, if you will, our full intentions, our commitment is from within. It's not to be seen of men, but it is to be from the heart. Whenever I think about to be seen of men, I always think about this lady. She has long since passed on. But when uh, Suzanne and I began our first work right out of college, she was a sweet lady. And right at first, uh, didn't think a lot about it. But every once in a while, she'd have us over for a night, uh, a meal, in the, for the nightly meal. Very good. And then every once in a while, we got a cake. Very good. And we were getting this fairly regularly. Then I realized what was happening. She would either call us over to come over for supper, or she would fix us a cake, and then she'd call the local newspaper and get put in the local column, telling what all she had done for the preacher Paul and his wife, or brother Paul. But his brother Paul, I believe, brother Paul and, and his wife Suzanne. Well, you have to okay. It, you have to understand the town itself that the paper was published in was 10 miles away from the town we lived in. We lived in a very small town. And so the the paper itself did the local communities in the area, you know, somebody write a column about what happened. And so it was, you know, you, you just have to, small town, Steve, you just have to enjoy it and appreciate it. Well, that was big. Well, you know. Well, you, uh, of course, you also got to remember, this is funny, you got to remember that's 36 years ago, too. <laughs> yeah. 
So, you know, we fed Brother Paul. But <laughs> it was it was almost, you know, and and you could almost, because I got the paper, it was almost like, hadn't seen, I won't call her name, uh, hadn't seen her name in the paper in two, three weeks. Bet we get a phone call. Brother Paul, I got a cake for you. I'll be right over to get it. <laughs> Absolutely, it was good. <laughs> no, no, she was a good cook, wasn't she? Remember, Sue? She was a good cook. Just thirty six. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you got more chickens. <laughs> we will let somebody know. Listen, we've never turned down a cake or a pie yet, have we, darling? There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, you're sort of like me. If if uh, I, somebody asked me why does Suzanne do the cooking, I think it's if I cook, we die. <laughs> oh my goodness! They do have restaurants around here, Steve. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, we haven't turned down anything. We never have. It's been good, and we appreciate it. That's what Jesus was dealing with. Jesus was dealing with Pharisees that were all about wanting to be seen. He wanted folks to see them, to see their righteousness. Go to the Sermon on the Mount. Six especially deals with the giving of alms and prayer and worship, and, and, and he deals with it from the standpoint of they were, or fasting, excuse me, say worship, but fasting. Do it from the standpoint to be seen of men. That was their thing. And so the the text here is Jesus says, Look, it's not it's not the externals, it's the internals. And so they needed to, to learn that. But isn't it interesting, to the point of being sad, changing thought a little bit, but still within this paragraph, is they want to ask Jesus, or they do ask Jesus. Explain this to us. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Jesus is there. Why shouldn't they ask? You know, eventually, if, 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 which we know is true because it's true for all of us, but Jesus had told them that he was going to die. We don't get this in Mark like we do say, especially in John. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You need to to prepare, and so they needed to know, and maybe that was the reason. But it seems to be, sadly, that it's just a lack of understanding. They just didn't catch on. They just didn't catch on. And, you know, you ask yourself why. You ask yourself why. And you come up with a lot of reasons. You know, Jesus said a prophet's without honor, saving his own country. And someone, I heard someone once say, can you imagine Jesus in diapers? And I said, no, I can't. But the point that was being made by this individual was in Jesus' hometown, he was looked at like the carpenter's son growing up. wasn't looked at like the savior of the world, like we would look at him. And, And so... These folks, you know, maybe that's what it was. They they just didn't get it because they didn't understand who they were dealing with. And so they keep this up to the end, till he passes away. But they never catch on. And yet the book of Mark, although we're fixing to come for the most part to the end of the miracles, there's three more miracles of 
two in the seventh chapter and one in the eighth chapter. And there are one or two others mentioned in Mark, but we kind of come to the end of, of miracles one after the other in the book of Mark at this point in time. And yet that's what Mark was writing. Mark was writing these miracles and telling us about these miracles because Jesus was performing them to get them to understand. You need to listen. You need to listen to me. You need to do what I tell you. Why? Because you're not just messing with anybody. This is the Son of God. We change thoughts. We get enter into a miracle now. But is there something somebody would like to say or add? Yeah. Um, the 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 best answer I can give you is not a good answer. <laughs> but the, the best answer I can give you is the word parable literally means to throw something beside another. And if you go and if you look back uh, in all of that and you look at where he talks about the beginning in verse 9, he talks about the Korban. That's his, that really, if you stop and think about that section in there, that is an illustration of the principle that he's teaching. He's teaching the principle of keep your heart pure because that's where everything begins. It's not these outward traditions of the washings of hands. And so he says, let me show you an example, Corban, and that parable that they have reference to is explain all of this to us but explain to us this this parable that's the best answer i can give you i'm not saying that's the answer but that's the best answer i can give you right yes Sure. I don't think that they were necessarily dumb. It's mm-hmm. just people trying to change it to suit what they thought was going to happen. Sure. You know, they were changing things, but it was to help people understand what they thought would happen. They were really in error. All right. But whether they were on purpose or not, I'm not going to say that. No. Because they were, thought they were doing right. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, it, it's kind of, of course, it's hard to kiss, kick against the pricks, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's hard to go against what mama's always taught you. And that's what Jesus was asking them to do. And that's hard. Mm-hmm. But you don't, do you? Yeah, a lot of versions don't. I mean, uh, the, uh, I believe, I believe, yeah, the, the, the ESV, which is probably a modern version, the best version, I, or the one I enjoy. I, I just read it for comparative issues. It doesn't have it. Um, the the uh, manuscript evidence is not there. Or it's the manuscript evidence is strong that that verse is not there. So yeah. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Yeah, that that gets us into textual criticism, and that's that's fun. I, <laughs> yeah, uh, but there are, there are other versions that no, they don't have it because it's not. It's actually not in, in Nestle's text. It's not in the UBS text, which are texts which are translated from uh, what you get the NIV. Yeah, um, I'm not surprised because, like I say, the ESV doesn't have it either. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Matter of fact, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Textual criticism is fun. I had enough. I had enough of that. <laughs> no, I enjoy. I don't do it any. I just kind of read some notes, and know what they're talking about, and I can look. And I can look in a apparatus of, of a UBS text and tell you. UBS is 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 a text is a Greek text. It's United Bible Society. Um, it's actually 
probably the best modern day Greek text. And what it did is it brought in five other texts uh, together, sort of make a combination. Uh -huh. And so it's uh, the UBS text is what us boys that uh, went to college when we started translating Greek, we translated out of the UBS text. It's just a, uh, for lack of a better term, and this is the way I've explained it to a lot of people, the UBS text is the United, like I say, United Bible Society. It is a translation, a Greek translation. It's not really a Greek translation, but there are many other texts. There's Nestle's text. There's, there's, uh, Weskin and Hort's text, there's the UBS text, and I've got two or three of those in my office. You ever want to see them? But <laughs> would, those, uh, would those say where the, would those footnote and link back to which ancient text they uh -huh. came from? Yeah, yeah, and the UBS text, uh, let's see if I can explain. The UBS text would be like in, in Greek, would be the verses at the top of the page. And then there would be a footnote if there needs to be. And then there would be like a line. And then down here it tells you the options. And it tells you what ancient text has this reading or this reading or this reading or omits it or whatever. And so then you go through a process. You go through a process. You want to look at, at age of the text. In other words, if... If this, say, if a text omits it and this text is, is, I'm going to try to make this simple so I understand it. <laughs> if, if the text is 6,000 years old, let's just say, and I'm just throwing out figures just to make a comparison point, and it's, it has it, and then you look at this text and it's 3,000 years old and it doesn't have it, then what is more likely to occur? The 6,000. So to speak, but you you go through other tests like where did it come from? Where did the text come from? How old is it? Um, how well known is it? Who was close to it? Uh, so point of origin, date. Uh, you also sometimes you use weight from the standpoint when you're studying textual criticism. Uh, in other words, we've got ten texts that say this, and we've got one text that says this. So which one do you listen to? This one text is a really good text, and these ten are sort of lightweights. But which one do you listen to? And then they get you into other tests. And so it's uh, it's interesting, to say the least. And what what I can tell you is what I believe. I'm going to put it like that. And that is that what we have is right. What what little what little study in comparison that I've done to what some great theologians have done, but what we have is right, and uh, we have different versions, and some of those versions leave out things. Yeah, we get into to uh, the the text of John eight, and some versions don't even show John eight, first twelve verses. John actually starts John seven fifty nine through eight eleven, not even there. Which is probably right. It probably wasn't there. <laughs> but that shouldn't. Th yeah. Yeah. But that shouldn't throw, that shouldn't throw a monkey wrench in our faith. Because just about everything that's questioned, say like in a, a passage in Matthew or a passage in Luke or Mark or John is found in other places, found in Matthew. You know, let's say it's not in Mark, well it's found in Matthew. So, so there's really nothing there that is that shouldn't be there, and nothing that shouldn't be there that's or should be there that's not there when you when you get to studying it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, maybe a word or two, and those words are very minor and insignificant. You know, an a, an and, the things like that. Mm -hmm. and Probably East Kentucky. 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 Probably East Kentucky
translation to read and that was absolutely right. But everything else was wrong. And he said that when he learned more in PhD, when he studied more about the Bible and all the ancient texts, and understood that there were conflicts and pieces missing, that his faith was actually much stronger, having known all that, and know that there's mistakes, that there have to be mistakes, and that he said that what you hold in your hand is a translation of texts that were the original word of God. And what you have in your hand is just not that, and, but it doesn't have to be. And he said when you when you realize how closely all these texts actually were, even though it have some errors, and he talked about how close the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are actually pretty late yeah. in the process, are to some of the oldest manuscripts, that uh, it just made his faith much stronger. Oh, yeah. Than it was when he just carried the, uh, you know, the King James, yeah. which wasn't even the original King James. You can't hardly read it. No, the you can't. And the and else yeah, was yeah, you don't. Yeah. Was that was, oh yeah. That it really is to be, mine too. Uh, yeah, no, you can't read the original King James. You know, everybody talks about. Well, I've got the original King. No, you don't. You don't have the 1611 version. You have the 1737 version. Yeah. He was talking about, we were talking one day, and he said something about diverse temptation. Yeah. And I, and I had just so happened that I think maybe George's last week looked it up, and it's an old English spelling of the word diverse. Diverse. Yep. And I told him that, and he said, There ain't no way you can know that. And I was like, So all these years you've been wondering what diverse temptations are? He said, Yeah, nobody really knows. I was like, Wow. Yeah. Yeah, see. We we all have to remember <clears throat> that Old Testament was written in Hebrew, New Testament was written in Greek. There's about nine chapters in all in the Old Testament that was actually written in Aramaic. And uh, there are scholars, theologians that have literally just studied. And, and I know I talked to Doc Woods once. Doc Woods uh, is Clyde Woods. Um, I guess Doc's retired now, but he was actually a teacher of mine, Fried Hardman. But uh, Doc went to um, Hebrew U to get his Ph.D. in Old Testament. And he knew of men that spent years studying the Aramaic just so they could translate the nine chapters in the Old Testament, but spent years. So there's a lot of guys like that. And, uh, yeah, your faith, once you see what you've got, the Bible, like I say, the Bible, the Bible is accurate, and the the translation has problems, but every translation has problems. I prefer personally a literal translation, King James, New King James, which I teach and preach out of New King James, the English Standard Version, things like that. There are what's called modified literal. Translations, which would be more like the NIV, which takes some tendencies, some 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 liberties to smooth out the reading that was not necessarily there in the text. There's. Well, yeah. Uh, no. That's true. But it, it's sort of, this is the way I liken it into. Uh, when I took Spanish, and I may be very wrong on this because that was 40 years ago, <laughs> 42 years ago, uh, I learned that como esta usted means how are you. That's the literal way, smooth way of saying how are you. But you could go up to somebody today and you say, come on, stop instead. And they may say, hey, man, how you doing? Instead of how are you? So when we get into translating, say, out of the UBS text, there's a difference in the way you approach the text. I read several for a comparative sense. I read the NIV. I read the ESV. I read the King James, the, um, the Revised Standard out of the Old Testament. 
I read uh, American Standard, New American Standard. You know, you can get on Bible Gateway or, or some of these others and read several versions, quite a few versions. And so um, they're good. They're all good. They all have their problems. They all have their difficulties. Uh, probably the best answer, I can tell you a story, it happened at Freed Hardman. Uh, it was college at the time. And this is in 45, 50, 50 years ago, I guess. Brother William Woodson. And if you know any, if you know Brother Woodson, of course, Brother Woodson passed away a few years ago. Brother Woodson was from Lawrenceburg. Brother Woodson was strict, straight down the line, very conservative, head of the Bible department at Free Harbor. But Doc Woods, Doc seems to be in the middle of all trouble. Doc came in and he used the RSV for the Old Testament, which is prob- probably the best for the Old Testament as far as translation goes. And uh, there were some boys in West Tennessee, some preachers, that thought because it wasn't the King James, Doc Woods was going to hell and Fred Hardman was going down to hell too. And uh, Brother Woodson called them all in. And uh, I, he, he was telling this story, and I was sitting in the actual room. He said, called them into this room. He said, we had them all there. And, and so what he did was there was a chalkboard here, that's the old days, and a chalkboard here. And he said, okay. What versions are there and what versions do you use? And they started listing. They list versions. And so he went around and he said, okay, are there problems in this version? Yes. And they checked. Are there problems translation-wise in this? Yes. And they came to the that there were problems in every translation. And so one is not inspired over the other. What we have is not what Jesus wrote. You know, of course, Jesus didn't write, but what Mark wrote. But what we have is copies through the years of what Mark wrote. And so we can be assured because there is literally what's called attestation upon attestation. In other words, manuscripts upon manuscripts upon manuscripts of the same thing. Because they didn't have Xerox. They didn't have photo, you know, copy machines. They didn't have, everything was done by hand. And that's where really a lot of the the problems came. The problems came in text because people would be writing, you know, and then something would happen and they'd look up or they'd go away or they'd have to go to the necess- necessary room. And when they came back, it was a different place. And so they, they lost their place every once in a while. Also, you would get um, – you would get – differences geographically. In other words, say a scribe would make a little mistake and all of a sudden you'd have 10 or 15 versions or copied text right here that had the same problem and nobody else had them. Well, why? Well, this scribe messed up. Somebody copied his copy. You know, they they didn't copy the original. They copied his copy. And so you ended up with with problems. And so that's that's part of textual criticism, but it's it doesn't it should never we should never sit there and say, Well, we don't have the Bible and we don't have what's inspired and and well no, we don't have the text that Paul wrote, but we have such a, an attestation to all the, the different manuscripts. That what we have, I thoroughly believe, like like the man said, say, we have what Paul wrote. We have translation of what Paul wrote. And there are other, uh, something else to be said, there are other books that were written at the time, say, Paul wrote First Timothy. There were other books written at that time. But by virtue of when they were written, where they were written, and who they were written by, were declared to not be what was called accepted into the canon or the accepted books of the Bible. And uh, uh, these books, you know, they didn't look at them for just five minutes and say, ah, no. They studied them and studied them. And depending upon what they said, it made a big difference too. You know, if they talked about things that weren't found in the other parts of the Bible, we need to look at this and question this. So. 
What year was what? Canada, Canada. The canonization took a period of, of years from, uh, oh, the really, let's see, Martin Luther came up with his own, with his own, if you will, translation, and it didn't include some of the books of the Bible. But so the canonization appeared, began about the 4th century A.D., 300, 400, went on. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it just simply means, <laughs> yes, somebody knows as much as I do. Uh, it just is an accepted group. And so they, like what they call, they canonize these uh, like I say, when you get to Martin Luther, Martin Luther, see, did not like the idea of faith and works. So he threw out the book of James and he threw out the book of Romans. Gone. A lot of them didn't like the book of Revelation. Gone. You know, of course, I don't like the book of Revelation. I like it. Don't get me wrong. But it's very difficult to teach. The rings do a. Yeah, the Rames Douay is the is the Catholic version of the Bible. It has the apocryphal books, the twelve books in the middle of the Bible that we don't have. Uh, I have an apocrypha if you want to read it. It's interesting. Um, the that's where they place it. Yeah. No, I think age wise too, it's in between. See, because because remember, remember our Bible itself is not arranged chronologically. So, so even though probably Malachi was probably the last book, time-wise, date-wise, 400, uh, about 432, if I'm not mistaken, B.C., uh, till, say, the opening of the New Testament, that's 400 years. And there are some folks that have problems with the fact that God was silent for 400 years. Anything else? Well, just, do you know why those were taken out or who made the decision that those would be in the Protestant, the Apocrypha, Apocrypha? Uh, apocalyptic. The, the, yeah, it's an Apocrypha. It's the Apocrypha, which just means uh, written before. The, yeah, the, the Apocrypha, well, it actually happened over time. It's because they began not to be included. They never were really included, first of all, in most groups that, as they were grouping them. That would be the first thing. The second thing was because of the nature of which they were written, the time in which they were written, by whom they were written. I mean, if you read them, they're fanciful stories that, they don't mesh, if you will, with <laughs> what we've got. <laughs> and so they were always questioned as far as their authenticity. And they just decided through time. Because what you have to understand is is you didn't have just one. Well, you did at times. But really reliable stuff was not just one man saying, I accept these books. These were men that would be groups that would literally study this over a period of time and find all of the information both within the book, around the book, and then what we would call the externals with regards to archaeology and things of that nature that help us to define these things, dates and, and, and so forth. And so... Uh, all of this happened over a period of time until things kind of settled down and basically we said this is really all we've got, these 66 books. So yeah, the, the, you, had a, you had a divergence of the text, which was re really the divergence of the text began, I said 300s while ago for the canonization. Really, you had a divergence of the text that began in the 300s. And you had more of a, that went to the 1300s. And then you had more of a canonization of the text beginning 1200s, actually, and going up to 
Well, you still have folks working on them even in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. And even today, you still have pockets of the guys. I don't, I don't get their material uh, because, for one thing, it's very costly. And a lot of the writing of it is over my head. Not a problem. Anything else? Well, I'll tell you what. We'll stop right there. We'll we'll look very quickly at the uh, next week. We'll just try to finish the three miracles there, um, beginning in verse 24. We'll look at uh, the miracle of this lady. This is it's quite an interesting story of a lady that comes to Jesus and her humility that uh, is noteworthy. But there's also another factor about this woman that is strengthening to me. See if you can figure out what it is. And we'll talk about her. We'll talk about uh, this deaf man that Jesus heals. There's really not a lot there other than it's a tremendous miracle. And then we'll talk about the feeding of the 4,000. We'll make an application there next week. Anything else?